Revelation chapter 1. That's where we were at this morning. Uh, we're going to finish up the message tonight. Uh, let me say, I am privileged to be a part of the Church of Jesus Christ. Amen. I praise the Lord. One of the joys I have had in life is I have a life that has been centered around the church. One of the blessings I have, my, some of my earliest memories are memories of church. I do not remember ever a time in my life when church was not important to our family. One of the earliest memories that I have is sitting in church on a, a Christmas Sunday. And uh, we had gone and then uh, the teachers got gifts for every one of the kids. And uh, the gift I had was a kaleidoscope. And that's that little cardboard tube that you look in and you turn the end of it. And I remember sitting in Sunday morning service. It was in the old building that, uh, that Linden Baptist Church had. At that, uh, one time it was Linden New Testament Baptist Church, but Linden Baptist Church had. Cecil Williams was the pastor. And I'm sitting there during the service, and I looked in the end of the kaleidoscope, and the end of it was tin or metal. And there was a little hole in there that you could peek in. And I have a habit. I had it then. I still have it now. I looked at that hole, and I looked at my finger, and I thought, you know, I can get my finger in that hole. And so I put it in there, and sure enough, I got my finger in that hole. Uh, it made it over the knuckle, and uh, everything was fine until I, my mom looked down and saw me with my finger in the hole, and she thought, he's playing with that. I'm going to get it off. And so she took put one hand on my hand and took the other hand on the kaleidoscope and pulled it. And when she did, it cut the finger all the way around, still got the scar around there, blood shooting everywhere. And she took me and had to take me upstairs and to the bathroom. And actually, we went upstairs, across it, down the back stairs in the back room to the bathroom because it was behind the pulpit. Uh, that's one of my earliest memories of church, and it goes downhill from there. Uh, but I am privileged to be in church. Now, we're talking this morning on the church misunderstood. And the idea is this. We are in, the, we are in a time when the church is under attack. And, and I'm hearing a lot of people defending the church and a lot of people attacking the church. And, and as I listen to it, I, I, I listen to the arguments, and on one side, they don't understand what the church is all about. I mean, you know, you, you hear statements like this, and I, I read this on Facebook. God is essential. Church isn't. And it's the idea that, okay, you know, we've got God, but you don't have to go to church. And, and I listen to the arguments on both sides, and I realize that one side is ignorant of what church is all about. But then as I listened and read those that were defending the church and going to church, I realized that their arguments were so anemic. And, and we do know the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some ends. And, and we brought that out a little bit. But there's more to church than what most people think. Uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit about it tonight. We made it up to really the third main point, And that's the purpose for the church. And, and, and the, the way I want to focus on it tonight is what do we get for being a part of the church? You know, what is it that we receive? Uh, why is it so important uh, to me? that I don't miss church. Why has it been important that we've had church all through this? Now realize some people can't come and, and they don't come because of the virus and, and, and you know some don't want to get out and take the risk, but I praise the Lord that we've had a handful of people that have been here during the services and and, and you know uh, we're we're still having church and you know we're following the guidelines and things like that. But but the why is it so important that Sunday morning Sunday night and Wednesday night that I be in church. Even when we're gone somewhere, when we go to visit family, when church time comes, we're in church. And so we're going to look at some things tonight, but we'll look at our text that we read this morning. So stand if you would. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 19. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Uh, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Notice it didn't say one church, but how many churches? 
That's seven. Seven. Seven's the number of perfection. And then in chapter 2 and chapter 3, it mentions all seven of the churches. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll see what God has for us tonight. Dear Lord, we thank you for this evening you've given us. I pray, Lord, that you would meet with us. Lord, I pray that you would give us a glimpse of what we have in church. Lord, it's not what you uh, expect, and Lord, it is what you expect, but it's not just that. Uh, Lord, there's a blessing that we have from being here. There is a necessity that we have for being here. And Lord, it is essential, even if the world says it's not. And Lord, I pray that you would help us as your children never to look at the church as something that we can take or leave. But Lord, help us to realize that it's, it's important enough for you to die for. It's important enough for you to bless. It's important enough for us to be a part of. And Lord, I thank you for the many blessings that we have for being a part of it. Now, Lord, bless us, teach us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. The purposes for the church. Uh, we looked at this this morning. We covered it, so we'll just cover it briefly. Many people focus on just one aspect of the church and not the whole package. The whole package. Now, usually when I hear somebody make the statement, well, I don't have to go to church too, the next statement they made shows me what they think the church is all about. Now, it also shows me what they don't know. But you know, you hear people make statements, well, I don't have to go to church to worship God. Or I don't have to go to church to read my Bible. Or I don't have to go to church to pray. And you know, my, my response to them is, you're right. Matter of fact, the truth is, if you're not worshiping God at home, you're not going to be worshiping God in the church. And if you're not reading your Bible at home, if you're not reading your Bible in private, you're not getting enough out of the Word of God. Uh, and, and so you need to be reading your Bible, and you need to be praying. Prayer ought to be a part of our life. The Bible says pray without ceasing. But the church is much more than just worship. It's much more than Bible reading, and it's much more than prayer. We live in a day where a lot of the bigger churches and all, their focus on the whole service is the praise and worship team. Matter of fact, there's some churches, I mean, they spend more effort and more money in, in their praise and worship team than they do in the preaching. Many times their praise and worship service will go twice as long as the preaching because that's emphasized more. But we need to understand, it's not just praise and worship. It's not just Bible reading. It's not just prayer. There's more to it than that. And one of the things that we ended on, and, and I just sort of want to emphasize, is this. The church is the body of Christ. Now, the truth is, Christ is so much higher than we are. God is so much higher than we are, we cannot comprehend him. Yes. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. And we need to understand, therefore, his church is for greater things than what we know about. There's more about the church of God than what our feeble minds see just here tonight. There's more about the church of God than this message. There's more about the church of God than the hymns that we sang, the hymnal. There's more about the church of God than the opening prayer and the closing prayer. And there's more about the church of God than just the fellowship of the believers. There is so much more that God has for us because the whole of Christianity is wrapped up in him. And he has given to the Christian, the church, to open up the door for the whole of Christianity. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. When I come to church, I don't want to miss any of it. When I come to church, I want to get the whole thing. You know, when, when I go to a buffet, I go up there and I look. I'm looking forward to the time when the buffets open up again. Now, I don't know if I want to touch anything that anybody else touches. <laughs> but, you know, I like going up there and I like looking. First thing I do when I go up there at the Golden Crowd, my family will tell you, tell you what's the first thing I get put on my plate. Meat. What's the second thing I get put on my plate? Meat. What's the third thing I get put on my plate? Meat. And when my plate is full of meat, I'll screw it in and find a little corner to put a vegetable, and usually the vegetable is what? Potatoes. Potatoes. Okay. Very, very well-rounded plate. Now understand, 
When I come to church, I don't want to miss a thing. You know, we, we were uh, you know uh, we were talking a little bit ago about the the the, the prayer. When we put out the prayer request for Stephanie, how many people uh, noted on Facebook, praying, we're praying, we're praying, we're praying, we're praying. And now praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. We're still praying, praise the Lord. And I look at it and I realize there's people I have never met all around the world that prayed for my daughter. That's nothing that the world could give us. But we find it in Christ. I thought about bringing the, the song list that Brother Boats put together, and I got to looking at the hymns that we sang tonight, and hymns of praising God, and, and hymns that elevated Him, and, 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 and really you look at it, and it fed my spirit, and I looked at it, and I thought, how important every one of those hymns fit right on the one before it and prepared us for the one after that. And so we realize that many people, when they look at the church, well, you don't have to go to church to get this, and you don't have to go to church to do that. I thought about this, you know. They don't have what we have because they're not here. Amen. You know, I believe we have a good church. I tell folks, we are exactly where we need to be. We just need more people and more money. And if we have more people, we could get more done. If we have more money, we could pay to get the things done. Yeah. But the truth is, we have all of God. We have all of him, and we have his church. So number one, many people focus on just one aspect of the church, not the whole package. We want to look at the whole package. Number two, the church is where we gather together under the God-given leadership for the purpose of our individual perfection so as to do the work of God and the edification of one another. Now, that's a whole point. Now, we have somewhere around what happened to our notes. Or did they just, oh, they're over here. Okay, we have the rough outline. The main outline was on the organ. It's over here. So if you don't get all the point, you can pick it up and take it with you because I want you to know this. But here it is. The church is where we gather together under the God-given leadership for the purpose of our individual perfection so that we can do the work of God and that we can edify one another. The church has a purpose. Ephesians chapter 4. Turn there if you would. I want to emphasize a few words. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. We're going to find the purpose of the church. We're going to find out one of the reasons why we come. We come to church because this is where we, we gather together under the leadership of God, uh, the leadership or the God-given leadership for our perfecting. It says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. You know, one of the reasons why I come to church is that's where I get perfected. That's where we get our toes stepped on sometimes. That's where we come and we learn about sin, things that are, are wrong, and, and it's where we come and we hear the Word of God preached, and sometimes our heart's touched, and, and sometimes the Lord reveals to us what we are. But we come to church so that individually we can be fed, individually we can be helped. It's called the perfecting of the saints. And why are the saints perfected? For the work of the ministry. There's a job that needs to be done. And I can come to church, and I can let God work on my heart, and he will work on my heart in a way here that he will not do at home. Now, if you will get in your Bible every day and spend time in your Bible every day, God will speak to your heart. But, you know, there's times when you need to sit down and let somebody else speak. There's times when, when, when God will take and give a message that will feed the people. The Lord said that he will give us shepherds that will feed us. And that's the purpose of the church. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and then for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, if you look at verse number 13, that first word I have in my, uh, where I've got the verse printed out in my notes, the word till, I put a circle around it. Till. You know what that means? There's a purpose for continuing. I'll tell you what, you can drop out of church as long as uh, once you reach that moment of perfection. <laughs> when you get to the point where you are completely perfect, there's nothing, nothing lacking in your life, and all the work is done, 
and everybody here has been encouraged to the point they don't need to be encouraged again. They too are perfect. And when all of that is done, we don't need you. You can go home. <laughs> now, that ain't going to come. But we're here till we all, you know what all means? All of us. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. The church is here to, so we all work together. We're all perfected together. And we come until we all come in unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. In other words, as long as I've got something lacking, I can't quit. As long as you have something lacking, you can't quit. Now, what that means is this. I am responsible for you. But you are also responsible for each other. Because we all come to be perfected, to do the work of the ministry, to edify one another, until we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. And then it says, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, we are completely filled with Christ in every area of our life. Now, you're not going to get that sitting at home. I'm not going to get it sitting at home. I need your prayers. I need your encouragement. I need your edification. It says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie awake to deceive. We come to church so that we can learn the truth so that we are not deceived by what's going on in the world. Yes. I mean, there's a lot of deception out there. Amen. And the Bible teaches us that Satan comes as an angel of light. And that Satan has his false prophets that are wolves in sheep's clothing. And, and the Bible tells us that there's many deceivers and, and they are going to deceive. And, and, and their father is the devil and he is a liar and, and, and they are liars. And we realize that, you know what, I need to know the truth so that I don't get swallowed up in error. Yeah. So that means I need to come and learn. So that we henceforth be no more children. I need to mature in the Lord. I don't need to be a child. You know, you can get a child to believe anything. And you take a child, you know, I, I love meeting kids I've never met before. And they'll be little kids, and, and, and I'll say, have you ever seen anybody wind up their nose? Oh. And I'll go, wow. And then I'll go, does your mind's nose wind up? And I'll reach up and try her nose. Oh, she's badly operated. I'm wind up. Kids will believe anything. Kids will believe a lie. You know what? You're not so smart that you can't be deceived. Amen. So we come till we reach that fullness. We come and, and, until we, we get the knowledge down. And then it says, speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. One of the things that the church does is it builds us up and it establishes him as the head of the body. He's in charge of me. He's in charge of us. It says, for whom the whole body fitly joined together, compacted by that which every joint supplies. So what he does is he brings me in and he brings you in and he brings Brother Bose in and he brings each of us in. He brings Patrick in and he puts us all together because he's making a functioning body and he placed that functioning body at 424 South Main Street, Mansfield, Ohio, 44907. The church of Jesus Christ in Mansfield. Fellowship Baptist Church. Why do we have the name on the church? So people know us from somebody else. Why they chose the name Fellowship? I don't know. But I agree with it. 
You know, I, I take it as the verse the, for our church, First John chapter one verse seven. If we walk in the light, as he, if uh, we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And and that's the thought. The goal of our church is I'm going to walk in the light. You walk in the light. As long as we walk in the light together, we can have fellowship one with another. If I walk in the light as he is in the light, then we can have fellowship with God. Amen. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. And so we realize that there is a purpose for us being here. I come to church so I can be perfected and I can help others on the way Amen. until we all are filled with Christ. Until we talk like him, we look like him, we act like him. You know, I would love it if when we all came together, we all talked the same thing. And not the coronavirus, <laughs> yeah. but about God. Amen. I love it when I get around some Christians. I know that our conversation is all going to be centered around the Lord. Mm -hmm. Oh, we might talk about a few other things, but, but when it's all, you know, before the conversation is over with, we're talking about something we've learned in the Word of God. We're talking about something the Lord has done. And when that conversation is over with, I walk away and I'm on fire for the Lord. You know, I get fired up preaching. I love preaching. The more I, boy, I just open up my heart and I get to preaching and talking about the Lord. And, and, and boy, I'll tell you that that fire burns in my heart. And, and, and you know, I, I sit down and I listen to a preacher that's preaching. And, 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 boy, sometimes the Lord will get a hold of my heart and my heart will be knit with his. And I really like it when he gives out a lot of good points. And I can take out my piece of paper and I write down all these sermon ideas. I mean, some messages somebody will preach. I get 20 sermon ideas out of it. And, and usually that means 20 series. <laughs> but I get sermon ideas. But that's church. I get the opportunity to be a part of that. And so do you. The companion passage is Hebrews chapter 10. Turn there if you would. Hebrews chapter 10. 22 through 25. Everybody's familiar with verse number 25 because I heard, I saw that verse quoted over and over and over again. Uh, and we'll read verse 25 in a moment. But they forget verse 22 and 23 and 24. They don't look at those. But Hebrews 10 verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Now it doesn't say let me. It doesn't say I will draw near. It says let us. See, you can't get away from the fact that God is speaking to a group. He's not speaking just to an individual. Now, individuals make up the group. Yes. Individuals make up the body. But a toe is not a finger. And a foot is not a hand. And you know, you blow your nose, you don't blow your ears. Okay? So we realize that we all are a part of the body of Christ. And so it says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Having a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. Don't you like coming to church and getting right with God? Yeah. Our conscience convicts us. Preacher preaches on something, and boy, it gets a hold of our heart, and we look at it. And, man, you know, I like it when the Lord points out my faults. I get concerned when He doesn't. Because I got too many faults for Him to be quiet, I got too many problems for Him to be quiet. You know, I, I like it when he makes me feel guilty. I like it when the Holy Spirit says, you know what, you're guilty. Thou art the man. Because then I know that God is opening up the door for me to get right with him. We can come to church and get right with God. Oh, it used to be that sinners would come to the altar. The altar used to be called the morning bench. Not meaning you come in the morning. It means people came and mourned over their sin. They mourned over their burdens. We don't have morning benches much anymore. A lot of times we don't have altars much anymore. But it says our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Aren't you glad that God cleans us up? We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
So we come and our heart is full of assurance. We know God and he's there and he hears us and, 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 and our hearts have been sprinkled from an evil conscience and our body is washed with pure water. And then it says, let us hold fast our profession of faith without wavering for he is faithful that promise. So it says here, we hold fast. We don't give up. We don't give in. Well, sometimes it gets hot tiring. Sometimes it gets hard. Sometimes we get weary. Sometimes it seems like we're just beating our head against the wall. Sometimes it seems like we're knocking on a door and it's just not going to open. And sometimes we look at it and it just seems like we're not getting any better. And it doesn't seem like we're getting anywhere. But he says, hold fast. Don't waver. Don't oscillate. Don't go back and forth because he is faithful that promised. Now, it goes on. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So what happens when I get down? Then you all come and provoke me unto love and good works. Keep going, preacher. You'll make it. Hey, keep growing, Christian. You'll make it. We come and we're getting tired and sometimes we need somebody to come alongside of us and say, hey, look, you need to get up and get back in the battle. You need to get up and get back in the fight. You can't lay down. You got to get up and keep going and get up. I'll help you. We lift up the fallen. And then it says, but speaking the truth in love, they grow up in him in all things, which is ahead, even Christ. Down here in Hebrews it says, uh, let us consider one another to provoke into love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. We gather together. We don't quit coming like others have. Do you realize there's people that used to sit here and encourage and be encouraged, but they don't sit here anymore? The Bible says, don't be like them. Don't be like them. You know, we can sit back and, and we can look at who used to be here. I call them used to be Christian. I meet them all the time. Well, I used to go to church. I used to teach. I used to be a pastor. I used to, I used to, I used to, I used to. But they're not doing it now. And the Bible's telling us, don't be like them. Because we're not perfect yet. We have not attained yet. We're not here yet. So it's not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What it's saying is this. If you believe the end time is coming, we need to do this even more. Right. We need to be more involved because it's going to get hard. I look at what's happening out here. Do you realize how close we are to losing our country? Do you realize we have, the, the, the government has already established the fact that they can determine when your church can be open or whether it can't? We have government leaders, governors, and mayors. We've had one that said, you know, you'll either close your church during this or I'll close it permanently. And Christians have rolled over and given them that right. Mm -hmm. And so we need to understand that, that as this time comes, we better understand there may come a day when we cannot get together in public. We may have to get together in secret. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, there are already churches that have done that. They got together at other times in a different place. And, and so we realize that there is an individual perfecting that takes place in the church for the corporate work of the church. There's an individual responsibility to the body. I have a responsibility to be here so that I can be perfected, so that I can do the work, and I can encourage you and help you in your perfection, and we can work together and do a work for God, and we get to be a part of that. 
Why would I want to ever give that up? Why would I ever want to separate from a body of believers worldwide that pray for me every day? You know, I have preachers and, and people that tell me they pray for me and my family by name every single day. The world never gave you that. He did. We have something special here. Oh, no, you don't have to go to church to read your Bible. The truth is, though, people that don't go to church usually don't read their Bible. Oh, you don't have to go to church to pray. But the truth is, most people that don't go to church don't really pray other than to get their own selfish desires. You don't have to go to church to worship God. But I'll guarantee you, the people that say, well, I can worship God while I'm fishing, I'll guarantee you that they're not thinking about God. Right. Now they might be praying, Lord, help me to catch a fish. <laughs> yeah. They're not looking at the beauty and realizing all of this depicts God. They're not lifting him up. Bottom line is, they just don't want to go to church. I get the privilege of going to church. Uh, they don't have to make me go. And, and so that's important. The church is where we gather together under the God-given leadership for the purpose of individual perfection so that we can do the work of God and we can edify one another. Let me give you another purpose. The church is given a commission to go to all the world preaching the gospel, baptizing the converts, and training them in the faith. One of the things that the, the church does, one of the things that God does, is he gives me a picture of the world. I'm hoping this week to get the map that was up here, the wooden map up here, I'm hoping to get it back here this week. That's where it's going to go, back in that section right there. I want to get it up. God gives us a vision of the world that they don't have. You know, the world looks around and they see poverty or they see pleasure. You know, they, they, they look at Switzerland and they see the Alps and they think of skiing. They look at, at Italy and, and, and they think of pasta and, and garlic bread and the Mediterranean. They look around the world and they see things. They look around the world and they see problems. They look around the world and they see opportunities. When we look around the world, we see souls. Souls. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. I like how it ends. Amen. Agree with that. Amen. The Bible tells us, go into all the world. You have a worldwide responsibility. Your mission field begins at the front door or the back door of this church. And it involves all of Mansfield and all of Richland County and all of Ohio and all of the United States and all of the Western Hemisphere and all of the Eastern Hemisphere Every individual, every purpose. That's a big job. That's the commission of the church. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. I'll guarantee you this. You're not going to find the world out there with a miracle mile. You're not going to find anywhere in the world where they're going to be, they have a burden to get a portion of Scripture into every home in Richmond County. You're not going to find very many churches that have that. They're not interested in getting the gospel to the unsaved. They're not going to help you reach the lost. They're not going to train you to be a soul winner. They're not going to teach you your responsibility and how that you will stand before God with blood on your hands if you're saved and haven't done anything to reach the lost. 
The whole of the book of Acts is a carrying out of the Great Commission. Romans chapter 1, Paul writes this, I am debtor. We come to church, and you know what it tells us? I am a debtor to both the Greeks and the, to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. I am a debtor to the smart, and I am debtor to the stupid. I am debtor to the beautiful, and I am debtor to the ugly. I am debtor to those people I like, and I am debtor to those that I do not like. And then it makes this safe statement, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Let me tell you what the world will give you. The world will give you anger when somebody presents to you the gospel. You ever try to give somebody the gospel and they get angry? I don't want to hear that. Where did they get that attitude? They didn't get it from the church. They didn't get it from him. I like it when somebody approaches me to make sure I'm saved because somebody cares. I like giving them my testimony. I meet people, I go out, to, you know, we go out on the Miracle Mile or I'll meet people somewhere. I'm a Christian, and I'll ask them this. I'll say, tell me when you got saved. Tell me your story. And they'll tell me their story. Now, some will, will say, well, I got saved when I was young, and that's about it. But I remember one time we were on the north side of town, and, and, and a fellow came to the door. We were doing the Miracle Mile, and he came to the door as I was getting ready to hang the bag, and he came out found out he was a deacon in a church, but I asked him, tell me when you got saved. Tell me your story. And he began to tell me his story and what he went through and how the Lord brought him to that point where he got saved. And boy, he had tears in his eyes, and I had a word of prayer with him, and, and he gave me a big old hug, and, and I told him, I said, you know, I, I like asking people their testimony for two reasons. Number one, I enjoy hearing it, but number two, you need to tell it over and over and over again. It does you good to tell your testimony. Now, God has given us that ability. God has given us a commission that gives us the world in a biblical viewpoint. We see people on their way to hell. We see people that need to get saved. And somebody has to get a burden for them. Somebody's got to tell them. And if we don't tell them, nobody's going to tell them. And they're going to die and they're going to go to hell and they're going to burn forever. Why do I want to be a part of a system that doesn't care about souls? Why do I want to miss a place where I can get a burden for the lost? All the coldness and the callousness of a Christianity that doesn't care. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of churches that don't do that. There's a lot of churches that don't go out. Oh, they'll go out and give a social gospel. Oh, we go out and we feed the poor. Praise the Lord, but you're going to give them a full belly on their way to hell. I'm not against feeding the poor, but I am against not giving them the gospel. I am against a religion that's all about social things, not about spiritual things. Without a church, there's no baptism. Without a church, there's no training. Without a church, there's no body. It's like having a baby and leaving it on the doorstep. It's like having a baby and leaving it in the alley. It's like having a baby and leaving it out in the cold. Aren't you glad that we got a place where we can go out and reach somebody? I, I, you know, I, I love telling folks, you come to our church, and our people will love you. Our people will care for you. <laughs> our people are just glad when somebody comes. The lady that spent the night in our attic kicked her way in back here and fell through it up there. I've never met her other than the night that she came. I've not talked to her since then, but when I talked to her friend, explained to a friend what happened and where the lady's cell phone was. I said, would you tell her that if she needs help, we'll help her. 
We can help her get victory over drugs, over prostitution. I'll guarantee you if she comes, the people in our church will love her. You know why? I don't care about the addict. I do care about her soul. God gives us that. Why would we want to give that up? Why would we want to be a part of a system that lets them die? A police officer told me he knew who the lady was. He had arrested her the week before. He made this statement. He said, the way she's going, she's going to end up dead. I was so glad to say that, you know what? God can change her. God allows us to be a part of that. Let me give you another thought here. The church is the work and the warfare of God for defeating the forces of evil in this world. It's the work and the warfare of God. Uh, There's a battle going on. We wrestle not against principalities and powers. We wrestle against the forces of evil. In Matthew 16, verse 18, it says, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The rock is the truth that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And so upon that truth uh, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We're not on a defensive battle. We're on an offensive battle. The gospel goes in to an area and conquers it. See, we think it's about them attacking us. No, it's about us attacking them. It's about us going into the dark part of town and turning the light on. It's about us going to the lost and going to the the, the drugs and the, 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 the worst of society. I mean, listen, we're living in our battlefield. We're living on our mission field. Last Sunday evening, Oscar told me, uh, uh, what Sunday was, Wednesday night? Wednesday evening, Oscar told me on Thursday that during church Wednesday night, uh, there were two guys out here looking into the cars. They came down the alley, they went and looked in the cars, and then they headed on down that way. Got on the internet, and are not on the internet, got on the security cameras and looked at them and didn't recognize him. But Oscar stepped out and said, you all are being videotaped. I hope you know it. They said a few choice words to him. One of them stopped and looked at the building, at the camera. He got a nice view of him. I just wish it was clearer. But understand, <coughs> this is where we are. The Lord says, look, I'm giving you a job to do. You are soldiers. Acts chapter 1, verse 18, but ye shall receive power, or not that, uh, let me get down here, Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. You know, when I was a kid, we played army. In my backyard, I have single-handedly, personally, killed all the Nazi soldiers <laughs> and all the Japanese soldiers in my backyard. I have killed so many Indians. I have shot so many bad guys. I have been a law officer. I have been a commanding general. I have been a hero. Growing up, I have killed so many people with a stick. (laughs) Because we couldn't afford toy guns. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a soldier. As I got older, I wanted to do anything I could with helicopters. I determined, you know what, one of my best chances, I mean, at that time, the Vietnam War was going on. But then the war ended before I got out of high school. And God got a hold of my heart and called me to preach. And I went off to college. Others went into the military, I went off to college. My brother went to the Army, another brother went into the Navy. But you know what? I went into the Lord's Army. 
I didn't realize it so much then, but I do realize it now that I'm a soldier. I war. I fight every day. Uh, I'm a veteran of a different war. And I'm still on active duty. Pastor Meach died a couple of weeks ago, but he died in the battle. Lord touched my heart. I was thinking about him today, and I've got a one of the I've got a picture of him on my cell phone, and 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 I, I on my cell phone I got the the last service where he led the singing. He's never really a song leader, and he never waved his arms. He just stood up there and sang, and everybody sang with him. Old Kentucky boy used to play the guitar and sing. He died a soldier. Lord willing, I want to die with my boots on. And God has put us in the battle. God's called you to be a soldier. No man that warth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. I have a reason not to get involved in those things out there because I'm not a fit soldier if I'm enslaved to the world. God's allowed me to be a part of the fight. He has allowed me to be a part of the battle. And he has allowed me to take on Satan and satanic forces. And sometimes it's hard. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9 says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. There's times I've fallen. Somebody was there to lift me up. But somebody was in the church. But notice what it says. Woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. You know, a lot of people used to be in here. They're out there now. They don't come to church. They're not around fellow soldiers. They're not around fellow Christians. And when they fall, there's nobody there that knows they can be there and pick them up. They're alone. It goes on from there. It says again, if two lie together, uh, then they have heat. But how can be one? How can be? How can one be warm alone? You know, you, you get away from church and you start going cold on God. Start going cold, cold on the things of God. But you know, when you're in the church and you start getting cold, there's somebody that can come up and put their arm around you and say, "Hey, I'm praying for you." And we can't get up against somebody else that's on fire. You know, sometimes my heart is cold. And I find somebody that's on fire for God. And I don't have to say anything to them. I just get around them. And you know what? Their fire catches on me. I don't want to lose that. And then I like this. If one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cold is not quickly broken. When the enemy comes and stands against me, guess what? I've got somebody... That'll come and stand with me. I remember back several years ago, I got a phone call. I hadn't been here very long, but I got a phone call. It was on a Saturday, and somebody threatened to kill me the next day. Said, I want the offering. He knew my name. He knew the church. Threatened to kill me. So you know what I did? I called Brother Lewis. That's been a long time ago. Uh, You know why? If I had to choose somebody to stand by my side, I want somebody that's packing, that knows how to use it, and won't run. Don't you run. (laughs) I be honest with you. You know why he sits along that side there? Because he's watching that door. Mm -hmm. Uh, Understand. When we're part of the church, we got somebody that we can call on. Hey, I need some help. It takes an army to fight the battle. Let me give you a couple more things here. We are commanded to be separated from the world, yet gathered together with God and his people. Amen. Second Corinthians six seventeen, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such one know not to eat. 
2 John verses 10 and 11. Uh, if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Ephesians 1 verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. We are called to flee from wickedness. We are called to separate from evil. We are called to, to gather, though, with those that are right in Christ. See, this is my haven. This is my oasis. I'm to separate from the world. But you know, when you separate, you have a void. Where do we fill that void? With God's people. Yeah. You know, my, my message that I preached on, 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 uh, on uh, I think it's 13 reasons why Christian ought not smoke and tips on how to quit. And, and one of the tips is this, use peer pressure. But you change your peers. Yeah. You know, a lot of people started smoking because of peer pressure. Oh, come on, try it. And so they started well, you know what? If you will have a bunch of peers that tell you to quit, it'll help. Now, it's still a battle. And, and let me say, there's worse things than smoking your tongue defiles you more than a cigarette. But what I'm saying is this. What's the purpose of the church? This is where my people are. I can't hang around with the world. But I can hang around with God's people. God says you don't need them because I've got the people you need right here and they will help you and they will feed you and they'll lift you up and they'll encourage you. We're to separate from the world. But we separate from the world and we separate unto God. And you know what? God's got his people around him. Mm -hmm. So this is what I'm separated unto. That's what I'm separated from. Let me give you another part, another point here. The separation from the church is a sign of illegitimacy and not belonging. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that it might be made manifest that they were not all. Of us. You know why some people leave? Because they never really belong. Oh, they came. There's a reason why they came. But you know what? They never really belong. Um, Matthew 7, verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets which come in uh, come to come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You know, sometimes people will come because that's the end thing to do. Mm -hmm. Some guys will come to get a girl. I've seen that happen a lot. Guy gets interested in a Christian girl, and, and, and she's not interested in him. Oh, you've got to go to church. And so he'll come to church until he gets the girl. And sometimes he'll stay long enough to marry her, but then he drops out after he gets her. Or he, or he comes to church long enough until he takes her to bed. And then he leaves. Sometimes he'll take her with him. But the Bible says there's some people that leave, and the reason they left is they were never really one of us. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 8 says that if ye be without chastisement, where of all our partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. You know, understand, sometimes God chastens. Listen, your absence tells us much about your word, or tells us much more than your words, your excuses, or your criticisms. Mm -hmm. You know, I read this a long time ago. It said, your absence from church is your vote to close it. Mm -hmm. So you're saying, I don't need it. We don't need it. Does this sound familiar? It's not essential. See, when they say, well, the church is not essential, what they're saying is, you don't need it. But what they don't realize is, I do. <laughs> See, when people don't come, they're just telling us, 
They're not a part of us. Oh, I used to go to church. Well, why did you quit? Well, I got mad. Another part of the message we're not going to cover tonight is answering the critics. Oh, I got mad. Somebody hurt me. Well, don't blame the church for your bitterness. Just because you're mad, don't blame the church. But understand, I need the church. When you're sitting at home, you're not telling people you're a Christian. You're telling people you're the world. So understand, church is not where I go. Church is not where we go. Church is not what we do. Church is who we are. It's who we are. Don't ask me to be something I'm not. Don't expect me to be something I am not. It has an organized structure. Jesus is the shepherd. The pastors are the under-shepherds. And we all are the sheep. It has a, or an organized function. It's the body of Christ and each part has a function. And we only work well as a body when each part is doing its job. And then it has an organized purpose, a work, and that is to reach the lost with the gospel and bring them in so that they can be a part of this body. And we can do more, we can edify more, we can do it. That's the purpose for the church. It is so much more than just going and being yelled at. It's so much more than a program. It's so much more than prayer, than Bible reading. It's so much more. It's the body of Christ. It's the body of Christ. And you know what? I get to be a part of it. And you do too. Essential? You better believe it. Are we going to give it up? Lord willing. With God's help, I want to die with my boots on. I don't think I want to die standing behind the pulpit. <laughs> because it would be too hard for the people to come and constantly remember the preacher kicking over, kicking the bucket behind the pulpit. But I'll tell you what, I want to die doing something for God. I want to end my days so that don't you? Let's do it together. Let's work together. And let's go out and find somebody to come in and help us. Not just fill up a pew. I'm not looking for people to attend a church. I'm looking for people to become part of the church. Amen. That's what we want. Somebody called the other day and they're moving up from Columbus. They were asking questions. I told them that. So I'm looking for somebody who wants to come in and be a part of the church. And you get to be that. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this evening you've given us. Lord, I thank you for this message, Lord, not just for us, but for those listening by way of internet. And Lord, I pray that you would stir our hearts. Lord, I pray there would be a revival of the church. Lord, I pray that Fellowship Baptist Church and its members would, would get a burden to be the church that you want us to be. Lord, thank you for letting me be their pastor. Lord, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this great work. Now, Lord, I pray that you put your hand upon it. Lord, anoint us for the work that we've been called to do. Lord, help us each to be perfected individually and then help us to edify one another. Give us a burden for one another. Give us a burden for those that are not here. And give us a burden for the lost. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's all stand, stand heads bowed, eyes closed. Folks, we are a part of the body of Christ. We are a part of what he feels is important. I have benefited from being a part of that body. I have memories of my childhood being a part of that body. 
I had preachers that loved me. I remember as a young boy, I mean young, young boy, I remember going to a church in Newtown, Indiana, Hopewell Baptist Church. George Phelps was the pastor. Well, I was so small, and I looked at him, and he looked so tall. I mean, I almost felt that his head could touch the ceiling, but it couldn't. And the reason I know is because whenever we would go there, I don't know why he liked me so much. But he would pick me up, and he would set me on his shoulders. And he would walk around talking to people with me, sitting on his shoulders. Probably doing that to keep me from getting into trouble. But I remember him walking through the doors, and he'd have to duck down, and I'd have to duck down. And I remember as a young preacher boy, studying for the ministry, still in college. But George Phelps was with his daughter down south of Crawfordsville, found out where he lived, and he was close to the end of his life. And I remember going down there and visiting him. He gave me a Bible study he had put together. It was all typed out, and he had a couple of cover sheets on it. I still have that Bible study somewhere. I can't put my hands on it right now, but he was a part of my life. Cecil Williams, Leon Ellis, Mina Davis, Jim Chase, Dave Meese, or not Dave, but Don Meese. Preachers, pastors. I had the privilege of sitting under their ministry. Pastor Frank Hackworth down in Wilmington, North Carolina, had the privilege of working with him as his associate. Men that impacted my life. And God has given me an opportunity to be a pastor. I mean, I live from message to message to message, project to project. I have people that I'm responsible for feeding. Why would I ever, ever, ever want to give that up for what the world has? Sunday school teachers, the day's coming when we'll have kids back downstairs. I remember somebody in this church years ago talk about how they love their Sunday school class. And they bragged about being a teacher and then the day came when they said, Preacher, we're leaving. And they walked away, and I remember thinking, how could you walk away from people you love? How could you walk away from those kids that every week you're teaching and you're trying to reach? And the Lord gave me a message out of John chapter 10 talking about the shepherd and the hireling. And the idea was this, that I'm the shepherd, I can't leave. Sheep are my life. They were just a hireling. It was their career. It was their job choice. Sheep are never theirs. They never took ownership. So therefore they could walk away. I can't. Now, folks, every one of us, we're part of that fold. All the church is it essential? You better believe it. I need it. I don't want to lose it. The government may say you have to shut it down. The government may say you can't come. But I'm here. If the only ones that can make it is my family and I, I will still be here. Praise the Lord. You stuck with us. To those of you that are on Facebook Live, please come and become a part of something that God's doing. Listen, we, we're, we're small in number, but we're big in vision, and we've got a huge commission. We need your help to come.
and become a part of something important.